Oh, okay, okay, recording's on. Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the very first ever Monero Meet. It's like the coffee chat, but meant to be less, uh, less, even less formal. So we're gonna see how this specifically goes. We're trying to add a new software too to try and get higher quality through, given some of the DEF CON feedback we received. So there may be a few additional hiccups, but we're gonna try things out until we get them right at a certain point. Uh, you're on uh, with, of course, Justin. Um, you've probably seen me in a lot of the previous coffee chats. Uh, we have uh, uh, Scott. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly, Scott? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Scott. Uh, I've primarily helped with the Japanese localization side of things since the GUI beta and with DEF CON stuff. That's it, pretty much. Awesome. All right, and then we also have Sarang Nother on. Welcome, Sarang. Hello. Sarang Noether, um, I am a contributor to, the, contributor to the Monero Research Lab Research Work Group. Awesome, great to have you on. We'll have some awesome news for you to talk about in just a minute here. And then yep. John, we're gonna try this again. Uh, welcome back. Uh, do you wanna say hi to everyone? He's been having a few issues. We'll. John, be, feel free to, to join in whenever you, uh, whenever you like. So, um, cool. Uh, I guess we can just get started with like some of the really awesome stuff that's happened in the last month. Uh, so, you know, really recently, Sarang, do you want to get just start off with the really awesome news re re regarding Triptych? Yeah, so um, Triptych is a uh, sublinear sized, uh, logarithmic sized linkable ring signature construction um, that's built on a particular kind of zero knowledge proving system. Um, and in a preprint, um, Brandon Goodell and I uh, worked out how to effectively use this construction and generalize it in a way that can be um, applied in um, a signer ambiguous transaction protocol, like could be used in um, a future extension of the Monero protocol. And this was released as a preprint, and of course, preprints don't undergo any peer review. Anyone can post a preprint, so you know you should always read it skeptically and with very critical eye, you know, as you should have with this. Um, but we also uh, did some submission to various locations for conferences and workshops, um, which can be a very long and kind of grueling process. And I'm very happy to announce um, that the Triptych preprint um, will be published in the proceedings for the 2020 Esorix uh, CBT workshop. And I never remember what it stands for, so I looked it up on this device. Esorix, which I never remember, is the European Symposium on Research in Computer Security. Esorix. Um, and that is a conference, and um, it's being handled remotely, you know, as a lot of conferences rightly are. And um, the particular workshop is the Workshop on Cryptocurrencies and Blockchain Technology, or CBT. So um, the, um, what was the preprint um, has undergone peer review. And it will be included and published in the proceedings of the Esorix Conference's CBT workshop. Um, and then I will be presenting it remotely um, in September, late September. I have to look up the date on that um, as a presentation. So that'll be very exciting. Um, I don't know right now if the presentations um, are allowed to be recorded or if they'll be made available after the fact. Um, I do know that it's possible to register to attend remotely for, I think it's 25 euros. So not bad in, in the grand scheme of conferences. Um, so hopefully folks who are interested in attending that can. Um, and um, we'll have a blog post up that includes a link to the tentative program, which includes a lot of other really interesting looking papers. So this is big news. Um, you know, publication and peer review, again, is it's, it's never a guarantee of, you know, the, the, it's no guarantee that everything is completely optimal in the paper, but it does provide additional confidence that the construction is worthwhile and hopefully it's useful. I mean, that that's... Phenomenal news. I, I really like how you describe to people the idea that a preprint is basically just a PDF upload site. <laughs> it, is, it, it, is a, it is a PDF upload site that does have a very minimal um, editorial, I don't even want to call it editorial review. It's just kind of editorial gatekeeping. You can look up, for example, the IACR ePrint archive is kind of the, the standard one used for applied cryptography. And they have a list of their acceptance criteria. And it's basically is like, it appears to be relevant, um, and it has some kind of claims or proofs. There you go. They specifically note that the editors don't review them for accuracy or correctness. Um, preprints are a really good way for researchers to rapidly get out research that's in progress to other researchers and practitioners. So, you know, anytime you read like, ah, a new study shows, you're like, well, what does that mean? 
preprints do not undergo peer review, but it's really nice because they're made available. And having knowledge be broadly and freely available is a good thing. You just have to be careful to understand what it means um, when it's in different formats and, and venues. So, you know, undergoing peer reviews is also no guarantee. Like some peer reviews done really well and some peer reviews done really, really badly. Um, but, you know, it's, it's an additional layer in the process. And it is a good thing. That's super cool. I, I'm sorry I have to interrupt, Scott. Is that a Stark Industries coffee mug that you have right there? Yeah. Do you also have big news that you're going to share now? Or no, no, yeah, no, no, no. Just, just a big fan. I have an unwieldy amount of one six scale Iron Man figurines and three D print models. So, anyways, yeah. Very far, cool. far, far. <laughs> I'm surprised you don't have your background just like making you seem like you have those like Iron Man suit wings or something coming out of the back. Yeah, I mean, perhaps another time. Yeah, I'm just, I like Ghost in the Shell too. So I have the Ghost in the Shell background is what I prefer to use because I feel like it's not too overwhelming or too gaudy or what have you. It's just a, a room shot. But Sorry, you know. so can you explain that to someone who's never heard of this before? Uh, what, what specifically? Ghost in the oh, Room or whatever? Uh, no, Ghost in the Shell. Sorry. So I it's a room shot from the uh, original Ghost in the Shell. Uh, so, um, which I'm a big fan of the various interpretations of Ghost Shell for the most part. Um, so, th we don't need to go into uh, a long discussion about the choreography or the, the shots and that, the, the themes in Ghost in the Shell. Just, I like it. <laughs> That's it. Okay, yeah, I've never heard of this before, so I'll certainly have to look it up because I have no understanding of what this is. Scott has all the really fun hobbies over here. I'm just, I don't know, lame. Spent all my time on Monero. You know, lame, like a lame person. Okay, really cool. Um, Sarang Unfortunately, I have to jump off the call. I'm glad that I could at least share the good news about Triptych. Um, and again, there'll be a blog post up that just kind of links to, you know, where you can find more information on it. Read the preprint if that's something you're interested in. Um, and I guess not read the preprint if you aren't interested in it. But we'll share the good news uh, on a blog post coming up soon. So thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Sarang, for being on. Um, very fun stuff. Uh, I have to click a button to actually remove them from the recording now. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, JW, did you did you get any uh, or have any luck on your audio at this point? Can you guys hear me better? Much better. Much better. Okay. Yeah, I grabbed a little laptop. My personal laptop died like a week ago, so I'm like in between computers. I have a desktop that doesn't have a webcam or a microphone and doesn't have Bluetooth. So if I want to use Bluetooth headphones, I need to use my phone or I have an old Surface. So I'm using the old Surface now. And apparently that fixed it a little bit. Other Everybody else's audio is a little bit kind of choppy, but I can deal if it if it sounds okay for everyone else. We're probably just sending too high quality data and your surface is panicking, if I had to guess. We're we're doing pretty demanding things. Like my, my computer here is like at like at ninety percent CPU use. <laughs> so I'm sure anyone that has a slightly weaker CPU will have have some trouble. So maybe we'll, we'll lower the settings a little bit next time. <laughs> Uh, but of course, great to have you on. Do you want to give a quick introduction about, you know, John, who you are and what you do? Sure. So my name is uh, John Murphy, and in real life, I am a scientist uh, at a national laboratory. I work on semiconductor development for kind of different kinds of uh, novel radiation detectors and energy harvesting systems. Um, and in Monero world, I've been involved in some capacity since kind of 2014, shortly after the launch. Um, I have made some really terrible uh, front end graphical user interfaces for uh, the wallet, as well as uh, some mining programs that are like command line only. So you put a, a little button on a panel that people can just click and start mining and it makes them happy if they hate the command line. Um, and I've also 
So, uh, um, help moderate the Ooh, uh, <laughs> fun stuff, huh? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, John. That was awesome. Um, of course, great to have you on the here. Um, okay, so uh, other really random stuff that's coming up. I guess it's not super random, but uh, the network upgrade is coming up in October, October 17th. So be ready for that because that's a, a big save the date. So the big change, of course, being Monero CL SAGs, which bring, uh, what, it's about 15 well, I, I should quote it. Reduced transaction size by about 25% and improves verification performance by, it says about 20%, but it's really more like 10 to 20%, depending on what you're specifically doing. But still, it's it's a drop-in replacement. It's been audited and, you know, really, really awesome stuff going on there. So expect more efficient Monero transactions in October. One joke we did in a, a recent... Monero Research Lab meeting was that the Monero transactions were too cheap now and too efficient. We we just have to increase the privacy because we, we, we you know we were at times worried about certain fee model things and we're like oh well if if the transactions are this cheap then we have to worry about it. But ultimately we decided that uh, we were actually were okay. But it was a funny Monero Research Lab discussion about us having to make the transactions have more privacy. Oh no. We just had to, right? I just thought that was pretty funny. Uh, the Monero community, we provide privacy because we have to for security reasons, right? That's that's a big takeaway. Um, also, you know, the Monero DEF CON Village happenings occurred on the Monero Community Workgroup channel, so make sure to check those out. Um, getting some... <laughs> uh, John's going to be pop popping in and out here. Um so, uh, yeah, I think his, his computer's keep having trouble keeping up with, with this, um, but uh, so be it. And then uh, Sarang was able to talk about the really awesome stuff he was, he was uh, also working on recently, um, besides just getting this paper accepted, uh, which is, of course, important. He also coded out Bulletproofs Plus. This allows about 10% improvement to transaction performance again, uh, just by having a more efficient Bulletproofs. He says in many ways, it's actually simpler to implement than the existing Bulletproofs implementation. So uh, I was talking about him, uh, sorry, talking with him about the work and about how difficult it was to code some of these things up. And I asked, is it uh, actually simpler than you were expecting? And he's like, no, it actually is as simple as I was expecting. So really, really good news across the board there, I suppose. Um, okay. Yeah. That's, I guess the, the big rundown is Monero has a ton of awesome research lab focused improvements ahead of it. We have seal sags coming right around the corner. We have triptych, which is more of a long or medium term thing. I think at this point, which uh, is seeing some, you know, really, really good feedback from the academic community. And then we have things like Bulletproofs Plus, which, although they haven't really been audited and will need to go through a formal audit process, they are pretty simple to adapt and to work with the Monero uh, protocol. So really, really awesome ways to make Monero more efficient, of course, going forward. And of course, uh, Bulletproofs Plus will continue to be useful even as Monero switches to Triptych. These are kind of like two different things. It's not like the Bulletproofs work will be overridden by Triptych. Both of them will be, you know, we can still use the Bulletproofs Plus work if Monero does go down the Triptych or Arcturus route uh, in the future. So that's that's probably too formal of, of a discussion that I really want to have for these, these Monero meet because it's meant to be just get people's faces out there and saying hi. Uh, however, it's important to go through that uh, information. I think in the future, we'll try to have a separate separate video walkthrough of, of news that are going on. Um, so Scott, though, I, I really want to introduce the community more to the ideas that you've been working on. You are trying to get a new Monero social media site up and running. So I, I want you to discuss you know, wh what that looks like and, and, and what your goals are there. Um, yeah, so I know it wasn't necessarily, I wasn't the one, the first one to discover it per se in the community. I remember, I want to say maybe two and a half years ago, someone made a post about Mastodon. I was like, hey, you know, it's, I know you all like decentralization. So here's this cool thing called the Fediverse and here's 
uh, Mastodon. So I want to say it was about three, two and a half years ago that someone posted it. I have to take it back up again. But at the time, like it was like the servers were overwhelmed. I think it was kind of like for those who may remember, it's kind of uh, as it felt as painful to get into perhaps as like Gmail beta back in the day where it's like, you know, this really cool thing, but it was just really painful to get access to. So I didn't touch or mess around with Mastodon a whole bunch until probably in the last year or so when it was easier and kind of communities have established themselves. Um, so like uh, to, to kind of explain it first, the concept, right? So the Fediverse is... Um, a set of, for lack of, a, we'll just call them sort of services uh, that um, similar to, I don't know, perhaps a bit torrent or the, the torrent protocol would be a good analog because um, it's kind of peer to peer. Uh, but people build up their own servers or what have you, and they all interact over a protocol called ActivityPub. I mean, there's some other protocols. I think there's like GNU status and a few others. Um, but people build out particular services. Probably one of the big, arguably biggest ones that's are most actively used ones is um, basically the, the the social or microblogging aspect of the Fediverse. So you have um, basically people who have different kind of. They can technically talk to each other, but like the technology stack is a little bit different. The UI is a little bit different. Um, so Mastodon is like you know people I've heard joke about was kind of the, the elephant or, you know, the, the, the mastodon in, in the room. Um, so you, if you're not familiar with mastodon, you can kind of think of it as basically Twitter. And like, but as I said, everyone um, kind of builds up their own server. And so, you know, you can have a community that's specifically for hackers and, you know, it's invite only or what have you. And then you have another instance that's for, you know, people that do photography in Tokyo or what have you. Um, so you can build these communities that you basically have different timelines. So you have like the local server timeline, so um, that which is useful for curating community if you're only really interested in or want to look at, uh, you know, find new people worth following or what have you. Um, there's like the, the the local timeline, and then you have the greater Fediverse uh, timeline as itself. But so Mastodon is one one basically technology stack of that. Uh, Pleroma is another. There's a couple others. So there's like Miskey. Um, so depending on kind of what you're going for, uh, you might use one stack over the other. Um, but yeah, the idea is basically. You own, you own your community, uh, which is kind of what has drawn me to it. I was particularly late, especially with the Twitter hack uh, last year, where you know you have essentially high schoolers, basically, as I understand it. I don't know if they've done a full formal report yet to the public, but from what I understand, it's basically high schoolers, social engineering, Twitter employees, and like Twitter employees, 25% of them have access to do what was it done? So I think the employee base of Twitter is like 1,000 ish. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but you know you have 250 people with access to an extremely popular service who can really screw over and do some damage. And so that that was kind of why I also like posted on Reddit or yeah, that was Reddit. Um, you know, warning. You know, if you see people like Fluffy or the Monero count saying things like send Monero and we'll double it or whatever. Or, I mean, obviously they can't really send it back because they don't know necessarily what address it came from. But, you know, something along that lines where Fluffy's like, hey, you know, convert your XMR to BTC or whatever. So you have people, who, my concern was people who can be easily targeted. So my interest was, and in, it's currently building up basically a Paroma instance where people who want to talk Monero are kind of tangential subjects can basically relatively safely um, you basically use the equivalent of Twitter, but without the security hazards of Twitter and without the uh, like data invasiveness of Twitter. So like, because these are open source things, you don't have ads. 
I know some people really hate the algorithmic timeline thing of Twitter. So you can do chronological instead of, you know, whatever Twitter is being paid to send your way or that kind of thing. So, you know, you have all these cool aspects. And because the servers are going to be somewhere in Switzerland, you know, there's there's that aspect of the, the legal privacy of, you know, in theory, hopefully no one... You know, we can do like warrant canaries and all that fun stuff um, to make it really hard, if not pretty practically impossible for, say, a three letter agency to get someone's, you know, IP logs off of the server if they spaced using a VPN or Tor or what have you. So the idea is both privacy and kind of security. Um, and I know there's interest. I don't know how much interest, uh, but I, I was originally introduced to the Fediverse like over two and a half years ago by someone from the Monero community. So hopefully it's something people like. Um, and it's worth noting, like you can mirror your, there are services where you can mirror um, like your status posts. So if you want to post in Mastodon and then have like a bot on Twitter, you, you can set up a bot to like repost on Twitter what you post in Mastodon or, or I should say the Fediverse. Um, and then you have other stuff like PeerTube, but that's, that's another topic. So, do you so do you know if there's a, a tool that perhaps we could host that allows people to connect their Mastodon to Twitter? So, if I post on Twitter, for example, it would just repost on Mastodon, or on Mastodon, it would post as my Twitter account. That way, it encourages you to use both, I guess. Yeah. So, um, I'd have to double check the service that I've. I was experimented with kind of like my few of my alts and it works reasonably well um, in terms of you can configure, fine tune it. So like, I don't want you to include my replies to my tweets. I only want you to include the base tweet mirroring or um, so th it's like crop cross poster dot mastodon dot donate, but the periods are kind of in weird places. I think if I'm remembering the, the URL correctly, I don't know if that's open source or not. I know there is a GitHub, um, like it's open source, it's on GitHub service, but I don't know if it's actively maintained. I, if I remember correctly, it hasn't been touched in like a year or so. Um, and honestly, I think it's pro, well, I don't know. Like it may be easier give, given the, the technical nature of a lot of the people and especially kind of perhaps the more i wouldn't say the fed or the fediverse is particularly technical but it tends to attract a more technical crowd i would say um those people probably tend to have a raspberry pi that, that they could probably just spin up a you know a, a job on and run 24 7 that does that for them rather than needing for kind of a centralized service it's certainly something we can look into but um if, if people ask for it but if one once this is up i'd rather potentially look into getting like a, a peer tube instance uh, up and running especially since they're adding uh live streaming in theory october november ish which you know we could potentially use to live stream for those who are uh not keen understandably on using say YouTube streaming. So I think there's definitely some use to have like a Monero based theme network where people can just talk about what they're doing related to Monero in a, a in a fashion that's not quite that's, that's perhaps a little bit more permanent than like just the IRC chat where you're able mm -hmm. to more clearly have threads in a way <laughs> but but also yeah. it's still casual not like a github style discussion You're, it's more informal yeah and i forgot like again there's, there's like so many nice perks to running your own server it's just like the list is endless but like all of those those scams of like you report someone <laughs> who like you know elon musk you know a picture of people who have altered you know via you know the dom inspector you know trying to get Elon Musk to say something like you can instantly delete those and just ban them. Like if you have a decent enough and large enough moderator team, there's no need for waiting for Twitter to like wait two days or whatever. And like, and all you get is just a notice of thank you for reporting. And da, 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 da. So yeah, there's a lot of cool things you can do with your own. When you it looks it. like, it looks like the 
the there's a website tool that you can use to cross post and the back end for that is open source and updated okay. 10 days ago or so there you go yeah, that's awesome. awesome that was pretty insane what happened on twitter whatever yeah. a month ago <laughs> yep yeah so yeah and 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 so like we can you know uh i know like there are people who uh i don't know what you want to say like name name squat there we go yeah like name squatting so like i think you know monero community was taken so it became xmr community so because you have at least on our server you have control over kind of the accounts you can basically reserve them so like um you know we can say yeah you know before we open up to the public i can you know basically post in dev or in dash community like hey if you want your name just let me know i'll send you an invite and you can create your account or at least preserve your name um that kind of thing so obviously it's kind of a uh how would you say benevolent dictator type situation in terms of you have to trust the people who's running it but hopefully you know given we're all arguably long running kind of contributors at this point i don't think that would be an issue hopefully at least more trustworthy than twitter given all the crap twitter does but yeah at least we can have those at least those discussions are open to the community to talk about rather than just this wall where we mean nothing to Twitter, to be honest, right? Like, like yeah, we, we yeah. mean exactly nothing to Twitter. But people, <laughs> people having good accounts in the Monero community at least have some value to the Monero community by comparison. So, oh, and before before I forget, another thing that I know people have been like, at least in Dash community, I don't know about the greater Monero verse, as it were, but. Like you can have custom emojis, so we can finally, without having nice. necessarily to pay Twitter, you know, fifty grand or whatever it is, you know, put whatever custom emojis we want on the our our instance, and people can use them to react to this or that. So that that is a pretty cool flair. We can just have you know all all the Monero memes just sort of compiled as those emojis people can use. That'll I think that'll help with creativity and, and give people a reason to use that over, you know, other things. Do those extend to other, like Mastodon or Pleroma instances? Like, if if, if you view them somewhere else, like, would you? I, I don't really know enough about how these that work together. Is a good question. So, I, I don't typically like. I would have to look into that. Um, okay. I, I yeah. So I don't you cross interact with instances like the cool thing about the fediverse is that people can pretty easily spin up you know alts for this or that particular interest so like i said if you're a photographer and you happen to live in tokyo there's like a tokyo photography instance and you can have you know account specifically dedicated to that one specifically dedicated to like ubuntu because there's one ubuntu.social that kind of thing um that's how I tend to use it, but other people may use it more broadly, I guess. So is your server public already, Scott? No, no, I'm still in the process of working with uh, the server support to resolve one or two issues. So it'll probably, by my estimates, Pluroma is rel- – I'm, so I'm using Pluroma for the, for the stack for the Fediverse um, just because it's less resource-intensive. Um, and uh, the stack is simpler, so in theory, it's easier to sustain long term. Um, and in theory, that potentially lends to um, making it easier to develop for the developers. I can't speak because I haven't contributed anything code wise to the project. Um, but in theory, you know, the simpler your stack is, the easier it is to build out features, uh, which seems to be kind of the trend with Pleroma. Um, I think if I remember correctly, like Pleroma had polls before Mastodon did. Um, so things like that. You're getting some feedback somewhere. So if I just signed up for an account on uh, the Fastodon server, 
then my username is only reserved basically at fastadon.org. Is that the way that it works? Correct. Yeah, it's similar. To, you can think of it kind of as email almost, right? So if you know you do jwinterm at gmail.com, that doesn't reserve jwinterm at you know Yahoo or Outlook.com or whatever. So right. So yeah, you technically can have people impersonating you in other instances, but I mean, if you have like a, I mean, it's like arguably any other identity, you you verify that's you with some other established identity kind of thing. And if we have impersonators, we can just, you know, block them from interacting with the server or what have you. So cool. when, our, when our instance becomes the most used instance, then it yes, be clearly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, I, I do wonder, like, to what extent it would create an opportunity for people to participate in the Monero community that might like, like, we're mostly talking about at the moment, people who are already engaged in the Monero community to become more engaged because they have this other tool. But I wonder if it'd be good as a, an outreach tool in a way to get people to participate who may otherwise not join. How realistic do you think that is compared to us just saying, oh, well, like, is, is it useful to say like, hey, uh, check out this, this, uh, this social media instance where people are posting about like Monero related things really often. So if you go to that server, you're going to see a lot of Monero happenings, sort of like when we put people to the Monero subreddit, they're like, you get to see all the Monero postings there on Twitter. You can just say, well, I mean, maybe search for the hashtag Monero, but like, that's kind of, that's kind of lame by comparison, I guess. What, what do you think is an outreach tool there? I mean, so that's, oh gosh. Um, I mean, it certainly can be used as an outreach tool, but it because of the niche, I'm not a, I haven't studied kind of the, the sociology or what have you, but uh, in terms of how people use kind of Plurum and Mastodon, so I couldn't really reliably say. Um, I think having recently looked at services like, um, ubuntu.social so they have like a few accounts that they use to do announcements like they have an account dedicated to mate they have an account dedicated to i think ubuntu itself and one or two other kind of official kind of semi-announcement type handles and those have i want to say it was like between a thousand and two thousand plus followers even though the instance itself I mean, here, let me just pull it up, actually, honestly, because that, that might be a good example. I know Fostodon is, I have an account set up at Fostodon, um, which I found I found some really cool stuff on Fostodon. So that's kind of the, just looking at the local timeline. So that's one of the cool things about the local timeline here. Uh, yeah, 177 users, 22 are classified as active on Ubuntu. So, I mean, Ubuntu is, I would argue, it's a pretty prominent operating system, and roughly 20 active users. But even then, uh, like the official accounts here, let me pull up the inspect the or the yeah discover users. Yeah, so like the official Ubuntu account has 2.3 thousand. Uh, Snap has 1.3 thousand, Mate 1.5 thousand. So, I mean, people from other instances will subscribe, um, and you uh, presumably, you know, follow these accounts for announcement and you know relevant news. Um, whether or not like a community actually f forms in the 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 local instance itself, I would, based on Ubuntu, I don't. If if it's incredibly niche, like a, a particular piece of software i don't think that there would be much of a community build up per se it would honestly the instance is probably more more of a micro blogging type uh announcement um mechanism i would say more than anything else which is fine which is kind of one of the reasons why i was spinning it up in the first place is to have something like that independent of twitter um but yeah. John, we just need to have some like moon giveaways or something on there. I, I know that wouldn't make sense because that's meant for a broader set of projects, but get people doing I fun just, stuff there. 
I just signed up for Fastadon as well, and it's kind of coincidental, I guess, that on the local server, like three out of my top five posts are from the Fuzzstone, who's like the Monero Russia guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, it's ultimately dependent on kind of the community in terms of whether community outside of announcements is formed there. So who knows? I mean, there's... Do you no... know how many people are like, if you look, like how many people are are looking at the federated feed on a given day? Is there like any stats on that? Uh, I don't know. Like, because I mean, because the... Oh, you mean, well, I mean... In terms of metrics, in terms of like people interacting, yeah, just like with in terms of is it like of one, is it one percent of Twitter users or zero point one percent or? I have no clue. There's, it's possible there's like a metric dashboard out there somewhere that that captures that. Um, it looks like it's doing about maybe one or two posts per second, I guess. So. The the Fediverse itself or the Fostodon? if I click on yeah if I click on the like federated timeline from Fostodon's website yeah yeah there, there's easily I think a thousand plus uh, Mastodon or Pleroma instances out there I want to say granted some of them are like super small so right so like uh, because it's uh, you know you can build your own thing uh, you know people like I said. Uh, perhaps with a service, except with Mastodon and Pleroma, will buy a Pi or a, um, a Rock uh, 64 and, you know, spin up an instance just for their high school friends or their college friends or their small circle or whatever. So it'll be like a private server with like maybe 10 users. So it's... Those are really nerdy high school kids. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they can, I guess if they want, you know, hardware and they go to their science teacher or the school and like hey we want to experiment with tech will you pay for it and like yeah here's a rock 64 or whatever yeah because, yeah so cool well that's i think something that is definitely relevant post twitter apocalypse <laughs> <laughs> yeah <true. laughs> yeah yeah and, and the sad part about twitter too is like a similar thing happened like related to access controls like maybe two years prior maybe a year and a half prior with like was it trump's account got deleted by uh like renegade twitter employee or something so like there's no Um, yeah there's no real like second factor kind of sign off you know turn the two nuclear keys for screwing over people um which to me is particularly troubling granted necessarily yeah presumably as an you know admin you could do that with mastodon pleroma but at least you know there's perhaps more of a face than there is some faceless twitter employee as it were you know it's like one of of you know five admins on this Mastodon server screwed you over or whatever. So if a, a you as admin could like post from other from like users accounts on to the timeline? No, I don't think so. I don't think you have that kind of control. I I'm, I like in terms of like just deleting. So like if I were so you, you could know, like wipe their account, but you couldn't be like presumably. impersonate I mean <laughs> yeah. like take over their account like what happened. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine, or I should say, anyone with <clears throat> like right access to the the Postgres database would just be able to, you know, delete ID where equals, you know, blah blah blah. Um, but obviously, that would be much more restricted in our case to a very, very, very limited set of people. Um, so. I will note, uh, I mean, and this will be noted in the server description as well when it gets like spun up. But currently, as it exists, to my knowledge, all of the like micro blogging type um, Fediverse stacks, so like MISKI, Pleroma, Mastodon, all of them, <clears throat> currently the admin, or I should say a person with read access to the, the database itself 
can read uh, private messages basically as plain text. So they're not encrypted at rest. The messages are like encrypted, you know, from your browser to or to the server, um, between servers to server. So if you're PMing someone in another server that when it's traveling, it's um, encrypted, but when it's at rest, it's not. So there will be disclaimer, presumably, because I don't see anyone introducing in the next two weeks. Um, but, you know, if you value your PM privacy, we promise we won't look at it, you know, and it's based in Switzerland. So the NSA doesn't have, you know, access to kind of without our knowing or someone else's knowing, look at the, the messages. Um, yeah, but you have it, to be, to... If, if, we're, if we're going to be honest admins here and be like, in terms of like what we can do maliciously, we could potentially read people's private messages, which I don't have the time, and it's not not in my interest to do so. <laughs> Scott's like, just there, like I really going don't through. care what people say. <laughs> I mean, people can be bad mouthing me for all I care. Um, but so yeah, so that's just something to be aware of, and I'll probably, out of personal preference, suggest uh, that the announce or the server description be like use something like GNU Jammy because I'm personally fond of Jammy. Um, but yeah, so there yeah, there yeah. are some cons, but Twitter Twitter is uh Twitter is unencrypted as well at rest. So, you know, employees can read your private messages and it's a much broader set of people. Uh so Yeah, but it's definitely good to say don't send, you know, passwords. Don't don't send your Monero private keys in this in this chat, right? (laughs) Yes, because yeah, because if the yeah if the if you're talking to someone else in some other instance and that instance is someone with read access to that DB is malicious, and then yeah, they can they can probably pull that. So yeah, certainly not a good idea. But it's in the works. So yeah, very cool. So changing gears here, I mean, of course, it was great to hear about this, Scott, and I'm really looking forward to joining in once this is spun up. Uh, but, you know, there's been some recent price action on Monero, and I do want to bring the discussion there a little bit because we have John here who just is uh, very active in, in a lot of the Monero markets channels and things. So uh, Monero, Monero went above $100 for the first time in, in quite a while. Uh, so I guess, John, can you walk us through the, the community sentiment, any fun Things that have happened as a result of this. We're, we're, what was the general markets activity? Uh, I still feel like Monero is a little uh, not as exciting as a lot of the other stuff going on in cryptocurrency world with all of the decentralized finance stuff. It's just still kind of taking a back seat. Um, but it was definitely nice to see Monero go over a hundred while Zcash kind of crashed back down below 80 bucks or so and i think i I saw in one of the channels somebody was saying like it was a very long time where monero was like maintained below the per coin price of of dash and i think we broke above that as well so people were excited for like two days there and then they started complaining when the price fell back (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Wasn't it only above yeah. for like less than 24 hours? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> well, it was exciting in the moment, of course. Uh, but, uh, you know, who knows yeah. what happened? I was, just, I was just curious if there were like some new, like over 100 memes or, you know, something that came out of that. Mm, I didn't see any, but okay. it's a. Uh... Definitely seems like things are picking up in general, and Monero is kind of late to the party, but starting to gear up as well. Yeah, fun stuff, though. Yeah, it was, it was kind of exciting on that end. Um, okay, any other fun, like, Monero-related things that are going on? I know two people are in the process of trying to hop on for the last few minutes of conversation here, and they're each having <laughs> their own set of problems, either waking up or uh, <laughs> getting to work on their computer all- I'll leave it up to interpretation who has continuously complained about <laughs> making it for, uh, you know, a 10 a.m. thing at this point. Uh, but, uh, you know, their time. So, uh, yeah. Uh, what else is fun going on in, on uh, your side of the world, I guess, John? Anything? Uh, shit's on fire, which is not fun. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. Um, not, yeah, I, I mean, it's just 
weird being stuck even before the fires like the whole uh covid shutdown thing is just kind of completely uh turned off all in person and i feel like i don't i'm not much of like a virtual networker and i don't know if that is the case for most people or it's just me but i used to go to events all the time in san francisco for you know meetups or whatever and i just feel like that whole uh ecosystem's kind of been turned off and doesn't seem to be coming back anytime soon so i guess we need to do more virtual type events to kind of keep the you know communication and community dialogue going yeah i think that's a good way to put it we need to keep putting in efforts <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, Seth, Seth is having issues joining, sadly. So we'll join the next one. Maybe, uh, maybe we could do one of these tomorrow. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> um, uh, Doug, I think I heard you there, but you're pretty quiet. Is this thing on? It is on. There yeah, you go. Yeah, we can hear you now. No, I'm talking very close to the microphone right now. I don't know why it's not picking me up too hard. No, you, you're coming through loud and clear. Good morning. You, you Good morning. sound very energetic. That was maybe the first word that comes to mind here. About 30 seconds after I woke up, I pinged the channel, so you can about imagine the state I'm in. <laughs> yeah, it just, oof. Sounds, sounds like you had a, a rough night last night, even. Like, <laughs> it doesn't sound great. I know. <laughs> I know you haven't seen this yet because I assume you haven't checked Reddit yet, but there was another person that responded for the tracing challenge and they actually did introduce some, uh, oh, what do I, what do I call this? Um, they, they added some graphs, even some pictures about some potential paths that, that money went through from one exchange, like Trinance to Botfinex or whatever it is. Oh. So, yeah. There's a to those who don't know. There's a, a tracing challenge that uh, Doug put together, and uh, we asked people to look at it. And there's quite a few possible paths to say the least, but it, it still is cool to see. That it was interesting to see someone use a, an actual graph tool in order to visualize it. This is the first visualization I, I believe I've seen so far. Uh, they 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 got an EAE in there, and then they got a. A few possible EABEs, and then for EABCE, it's just is a total mess. And they're like, "Yeah, this is just just this is not fun." <laughs> so I guess Doug, do you want to talk about what you did for the challenge here? Before we go, I think I should, since technically it's not finished. I could talk about the various types of things that I included. <laughs> sure, if you want. Um. I mean, I have an EAE, EABE, a bunch of dummy transactions, Mr. Churns, who churns a bunch of times, um, and then I, I think that might be it. There, there's, there are a couple different linked transactions between the two exchanges. I have like a dozen wallets on my computer now that all received random bits of dust and shuffled it between themselves for this. Um. I should probably have done it over the course of a week or a month. Actually, Justin, do you want to design a better puzzle than I did that's not restricted? Uh, I mean, I could, but that... Uh, eh. Like you're doing much with the community recently. True. <laughs> no, I, it takes a lot of work to put these puzzles together, even over a certain day period. Do you mean, how many hours did it take for you to do a what one-day puzzle, Doug? That's different. Um, in, I was planning on writing out when the transactions would be performed ahead of time. And Not so sure. like, it would say, yes, just make a transaction now. And I just wouldn't have to think about it. Plus, I uh, you even exit scammed. You took a few dollars from me, from Monero. Uh, hopefully this isn't going to be live. Or not it's, live. It's, it's not live. Published. I am too tired for this to be published. <laughs> okay. 
Well, oh. um, one other thing to talk about. I don't. Maybe I missed it because I was having some connection difficulties. Uh, but DSC's new wallet coming out is pretty exciting. Good uh, one. The yes, Feather. we did not talk about that. Do you want to? I love take? Electrum, and it looks exactly like Electrum. Um, because I don't care about my privacy at all, so I use Electrum all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited. I mean, I I don't mind using the CLI or anything, but that looks like a pretty cool tool that should hopefully allow for uh, like lighter weight usage on laptops and stuff. I really like the freeze and thaw feature, like where you get to freeze outputs. I, I do think that there's a ton of opportunity to have a Monero wallet that is based around the entire idea of your outputs. Like you don't log in, you don't care about addresses, you don't care about full balance or anything. You just you, you log in and you just have you're presented with a list of like all the bills and coins that you have and then it's like well this bill came from here or this bill you know you, you then are like I want to send money and you you highlight the bills you want to send and hit send or whatever and that it'll... seems pretty niche but <laughs> okay maybe but if it was I, like I... if it was a part of the feather wallet which it seems like it, it's gonna be right that's a nice definitely a nice feature to have. Yeah. For for the few folks who care about that, right? <laughs> for the few folks who are like, I want this one to be churned and keep track of stuff like that. But yeah, that's it's really exciting work from DSC. And and one other person, right? It was a two yeah, let me, person. Let me look that effort. up just so I can not... just so we fairly attribute them, because I don't want to get throw someone under the bus for I don't yeah, know how much it work is. They put it's in. it's one other person doing the coding, and I think he's got some other people helping to run some in the nodes that they're going to use. I think I'm not positive about that. I do not know how to pronounce this. Uh, it's T O B. T O H T, so like Tob Tote, maybe. Uh, but yeah, DSC and Tob Tote have been working on this uh, so far, and you know it, it received comments from people like Celsta who work very heavily on the official Monero GUI, and they're like, yeah, it's awesome that we have another option. We need more options. We need people doing their own thing. It can't just be Monero official GUI that's the main wallet used. It has to be a bunch of other stuff. I mean. It's, it's, it, the original plan was actually to get the Monero GUI working on devices like Android, right? There, there were certain mock-ups that we had back in 2017 to potentially do something like that, and they just never materialized. I it's, think uh, maybe Hike had built it for Android. He's, I mean, he was always into doing builds for ARM, and I know he had built the daemon and stuff for Android, and I think he had built it for Android at some point, yeah, so I don't know what happened to that either. Yeah, it kind of just fell off. After, I think after like Monorio and Cake became a thing, people were like, eh. yeah. I mean, yeah. There, I think there's still an opportunity to do that, but that's an example where other wallets help fill in needs that the GUI just doesn't do as well as potentially other options. Um, yeah. I think people, kind of going off of DSE's comments too, and, you know, like endogenics comments at Confranco last year, I think part of the issue of like trying to recycle the core wallet is the wallet too uh, issue that tends to come up. Um, and just like the intermixing of logic in, a, in the GUI layer that really shouldn't be in the GUI layer to begin with, from what I've heard. So, but yeah, still super fun day. stuff. <laughs> okay any uh closing thoughts then we, we've gone on for about an hour here it was, it was fun so far uh nothing here though i'm glad i actually managed to make it in time for the first one <laughs> you technically showed up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay uh with that then i think i'm gonna close the first monero meet woohoo congrats everyone for showing it was fun we'll do the next one later soon um and then uh we'll make sure to make the other ones even more fun, uh, but it was, it was of course good to check in. Lots of really exciting things happened in the last in the last few months here. Cool, good okay. to see you guys. Happy yep. Saturday. Yep. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.